the flux of electrons. Uh, here you see Rutherford and the scheme of his experiment, and he remember studied uh, scattering of alpha particles on the uh, gold uh, plate, and he saw a strong, uh, um, strong scattering of these alpha, big angles of scattering. Uh, neutron has been discovered by Chadwick, and uh, you see here on the left hand side Chadwick with, with, with Rutherford. Um, now photons, you see Compton. Well, actually, no. Uh, all these discoveries and schemes and models, experiments, actually there are real people behind this. You should remember it. Not too many, actually, people. So, first impression, there's a lot of uh, guys, physicists, and whatever. Well, actually, there are not many individuals which really contributed to the field. So Compton, remember, he measured the change of the frequency of the light. And the change of the frequency of the light is the function of, uh, of the angle of scattering. And uh, that change corresponded precisely interpretation of light in terms of uh, flying particles. So neutrino, and here you see Pauli. And uh, Enrico Fermi, I don't know what he's showing in this, uh, in the, uh, on the blackboard. Cherenkov, Cherenkov radiation. And you see here, um, so that's up uh, right uh, play uh, photo is, is uh, the view of atomic reactor. And uh, and also, and then here is Super Kamiakande before, so it was closer, also Super Kamiakande because of, uh, because of this uh, light, shading of light, it's a bluish type. And here you see propagation of particle, which is going from, from this, this is probably the neutrino, which produces here muon, and then muon propagates in the atmosphere. No, here is an ice cube, actually, so it, it propagates in water, and here you see the strings of photomultipliers, which detect again Cherenkov light, and we see the cone of Cherenkov radiation. Now, this is super Kamiakande detector, which I have described already for you. Um, this is interior of this detector, and you see uh, people repair some photomultipliers. This is huge, huge tank of uh, filled in by water, but here water is evacuated. Uh, and, uh, uh, so it, the walls are covered by photomultipliers to see what's going on inside this volume. So the height is something like 40 meters, and the, the diameter is about 40 meters also. It's huge. And actually, I was in this place before it started operating in, in 95. And then in 95, 96, before it was filled by water, they organized uh, concerts, music concerts. And acoustic was absolutely, you know, perfect, you know, wonderful. And then people start to say, maybe you will not do this experiment. Let us continue with music. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, this experiment had a problem in the beginning of 2000s. Uh, when it was explosion of one of the photomultipliers. And then what happened is another shock wave, not Cherenkov light, another shock wave propagated in water and destroyed many photomultipliers. Uh, and so then repair the, these photomultipliers changed a uh, uh, large number of these uh, devices. Now these are events observed by Super Kamiakande, and you see the rings, and the rings are not small, it's not just something like this. It's tens of meters. It's not a small. Now, the color corresponds to time. So, of course, this is not what they really see. This is already cartoon. So, uh, that's what they did is um, uh, they uh, make kind of uh, colors depending on the time of arrival, which actually corresponds to the fact that you have not just a uh, you know, perpendicular motion of the particle. Uh, in this case, you would have something like this. So that would correspond to particle moving in this way. However, if you have a uh, particle moving at some angle with respect to plane, mm -hmm. then you see arrival at different times, which is also important information. So not only that you uh, see uh, deviation from circle, a uh, uh, picture of this ring, you also see timing, which actually allows you to, to fix direction quite well. Um, here you see single ring events. So here is a multi-ring event. 
when you have several particles, and so you can actually uh, uh, determine 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 even more complicated uh, major more complicated processes. So what they observe is uh, so-called mu-like events, most of these events, which are produced by muon neutrinos. Uh, you see directions there on uh, nuclei with muon in final state and uh, and electron neutrinos, which produce electrons and. Uh, uh, they can distinguish these two things, remember, because uh, I, I explained this already, because electrons have uh, multiple scattering and therefore the rings have a no uh, very kind of sharp borders. I think this corresponds to, to muons, so there's kind of sharp border in contrast to the upper plane uh, where you have most probably electron with kind of diffused signal. And each of these points are for the multipliers. So this as big as this, you can imagine what this kind of uh, uh, size of uh, this experiment and the pattern. So, in the case of electron, what did you do with the uncertainty? In, because the ring is not indefinite. Yeah, so you see what they are doing kind of... Uh, 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 so, of course, um, they find the ring which corresponds to the bigger number, density of what the multipliers and energy release. Okay? So that, in average, determines the, the direction of the trajectory. So what's going on? Why are you guessing? <laughs> Strange. Okay. So uh, this is again explanation. You see in the upper pl uh, plane you have muon neutrina and electron neutrina in and the down plane. And this is how they uh, actually, uh, so that's, uh, you see, what you would have if uh, there is no uh, scattering, multiple scattering. And, uh, and uh, so then they determine roughly what, what would be this, this uh, uh, Victor Hess with this balloon experiment. And remember, he established that uh, the discharges of uh, Electroscopes increased when uh, the height of uh, where you put this your equipment uh, increases. Now this is what people repeated on the hundredth anniversary of this experiment. They repeated the things, and this is kind of electroscope similar to what they used, uh, yeah, what uh, uh, what uh, Hess was using. So they repeated this for fun. First. Now cosmic rays. Uh, on the left hand side you see how this uh, cosmic ray develops. You have uh, iron nuclei which uh, hits the atmosphere, for instance nitrogen-14, and then many secondary particles uh, uh, are generated, and even different vertices. So you have secondary particles, so then the third generation of particles, fourth generation, and uh, you have development of, of this uh, hadronic uh, shower, uh, hadronic cascade. Uh, so, pions are produced, muons, in the case of pions, then K mesons, some heavy particles also produced. Now, um, this is kind of really huge phenomenon. And uh, here again, you see kind of picture of, uh, of the size of these showers uh, if, when high energy particle hits the atmosphere. Geometrically, this is, uh, this is correct representation. You see, that's kind of uh, 20 or oh, 10 kilometers from the surface, and then you see how big is uh, the shower which reaches the, the, uh, the, uh, the surface of the Earth. Uh, here you see the spectrum, uh, which I have explained. So there are this uh, knee and ankle of, in the spectrum. Roughly, it's uh, almost like a line. Uh, here you see, oh, okay, so this is some installation like Auger to detect uh, the particles uh, at the surface of the Earth. Uh, so what is here, again, some, some experiments of detection of cosmic rays. And I mentioned already uh, uh, this type of the experiment when, you, when atmosphere is actually the target and you see uh, uh, development of, uh, of, of the events. And so these events produce not only particles at the surface, but also radiation, giant of radiation. And, uh, and also fluorescence. And so you can detect uh, this radiation and see how uh, the shower develops. 
Now, I said already that uh, one of quite recent developments is detection of high energy neutrinos, which came from cosmic space. Here you see on the left hand side a uh, ice cube detector, which is in Antarctica, and uh, the upper plane is uh, so the, the surface of the ice. In Antarctica, the depth of the ice is more than two kilometers or two, three kilometers. So uh, you see here the strings. So they kind of fixed uh, what, what they did. They put some holes using hot water to make uh, the holes in the ice and then put strings to which uh, photomultipliers are attached. Uh, uh, so 86 strings are, uh, uh, you see here. And uh, so that size of this, you, you see here Eiffel uh, Tower and uh, the size is one kilometer height of the strings at which photomultipliers are attached. And almost one and a half kilometer from the upper uh, photomultiplier to the surface. And this upper part is just a shielding. Now these are, again, pictorial pictures of a uh, few events, two events actually, two first events uh, on the basis of which they claim, uh, um, they claim that uh, they see these uh, cosmic ray neutrinos. They correspond to showers, so most probably this is induced by electron neutrino which produces electron and then you have development of shower. So, how to read this? So, these points correspond to photomultipliers. So, the size of this event is really huge, it's like, you know, all this area. Uh, so, this is one event produced by a single particle. Now, the size of these blobs corresponds to energy release or detector, detection energy detected by a given photomultiplier. Okay? So, which means that here is a small energy release, small number of photons. Uh, here is a big one. And clearly, the center of events is here, somewhere here. So, this means that electron neutrino produce pro most probably electron here. And uh, this shower, electromagnetic shower, it has not well directionality. So, it's kind of more like isotropic event and you have a uh, propagation of the developments of these electromagnetic cascades in all the directions. So you see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's like, a, like of this size, the land of this size. And here you see the energy of one of these events is, en energy release is ar around one PeV, which is thousand TeVs and this is 1.4, they give even the names, Ernie and Bird, because you know, it's so kind of, uh, not so often events, so rare events, you can give even the names for these events. Now, uh, this is slide about sources of the cosmic rays. Here is uh, supernova and nebula, and you see already the relic of, uh, of, uh, of this expanded uh, envelope, and uh, uh, Fermi mechanism uh, is uh, acceleration of particles uh, and the shock waves propagating in, in, in these expanding envelopes. So this is for very high energy events. This is a real picture of, and of course, enhanced multiplied. You see here some object like active galactic nuclei, where in the center is black hole, very massive black hole. And you see here jets propagating on the space of huge size, it's bigger than our galaxy. So this, these jets, ultra-relativistic jets, so it's established that the material moves with velocity close to velocity of light, and it's not a joke, it's not just some few protons. It's huge, of number of uh, solar masses are in, in these jets. So inside these jets there are shock waves also, and it seems those guys can accelerate particle, uh, cosmic rays up to very high energies. Now Wilson with his chamber, I, uh, this is kind of the, the real picture of the chamber, of, of, you see this is uh, 16.5 centimeters and uh, so uh, the, the deep is some 3.4 centimeters like, like this, this small device. And uh, so below you see the pump. Uh, okay, what else? Now, this is 
this is the event of positron. Uh, this positron, which was interpreted as a positron. So remember, we discussed that uh, the track, so the particle enters the detector here, and uh, this is a lead plate. It crosses, loses the energy, and therefore curvature, uh, uh, the radius, the more radius is, uh, is bigger, a smaller after crossing. So the particle loses the energy uh, while crossing uh, 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 the plate. Okay, so and remember, this track is due to what? Due to these small droplets formed in the ionization places. So this is pion discovery. And you see tracks which I have discussed already. So uh, uh, you see uh, the middle track, the second one is uh, practically the same uh, in all these trajectories. And I can give you the problem to, to to, to, to find out what is the length of this track. Can you guess immediately? So since you know this guy, you know, this is muon, you know what is the energy of muon because this is decay of pi, so you can find what is the energy of muon, and then since uh, this is uh, ionization energy loss, you can compute what should be the track when muon loses the energy almost completely. All right, so I don't want to do this now. So, uh, and then this, the authors are of this discovery are Chiellini, Powell, and Lattes. They have discovered it? Hmm? They discovered it independently or they... No, they, they were together. So they were why only one of them wondered? Ah, it's a question is... Uh, 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 well, actually, I don't know if uh, I think Chiellini... That's, uh, that was quite soon after this guy this survived. <laughs> then the question is. So, good question. I'll check. Okay. Good question. Who? Why Achillini? Uh, now, this K mesons. See, when you see this picture, oh, you'll say, okay, maybe this is very interesting to end. No? So, this is something interesting, huh? So, what is this? How you would. And this is a key uh, cloud chamber. But it turns out the most important event is, is this one. She was okay, what is this? But well, this is V. Remember V event, I discussed this. This is a, a, a decay of uh, some particle onto uh, pi, it's pi plus, pi minus. So one should have big experience, right, to make interpretation of the, all, the, all these tracks. There's another one in, 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 in that picture, and this is uh, K decay into muon and neutrino. You know, so you see, and the experimentalist knows so this is not interesting, this is not interesting, that that's something you know trivial. But this is one. So it's kind of the most uninteresting, you know, from, from outside. You see this was something. <laughs> but this is a discovery, right, of K Meson. Uh, now neutrinos, you see Fred Rhinus, and here Frinus and Cohen, they are sitting and what they are detecting. Uh, they, they are looking at, at these pulses, right? Electric pulses produced by by uh, annihilation of positron and then capture of neutron and emission of photons. So this is uh, this is scheme of atomic reaction. This is the first experiment in uh, '53, and it was like a cylinder, and you see it is uh, surrounded by uh, by photomultipliers. So in the second series of the experiments, they have this uh, three. Uh, scintillator detectors and uh, between them water. Um, so this is Kamland I mentioned uh, uh, such an experiment again uh, experiment with uh, atmospheric sorry with uh, reactor antineutrinos detection of inverse beta decay and so this device has been used first of all to detect uh, 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 neutrinos from many atomic reactors and with average distance 180 kilometers and uh, <coughs> so it's uh, already quite big uh, <coughs> scintillator detector. You see inside you have a scintilla this uh, scintillator inside and again surrounded uh, by, by photomultipliers. So the number of photomultipliers is uh, almost 2000. The diameter is 18 meters and uh, so on. It's written that 53 atomic reactors have contributed substantially to the signal in this detector. Now you see people are 
staying up to this detector. So now this detector is still working, but they are aimed at the detection of neutrino less double D decay. So there is some material inside of this, and they're looking for uh, neutrino less beta decay. Uh, and I will discuss this uh, in the last part of the course. This is another um, reactor experiment, which actually measured one three mode of, uh, of oscillations uh, in China, Dia Bay, and you see here. Uh, this is A H1, A H2, and 3. These are uh, detection area, and each of them looks like you see here. So there are four detectors inside some uh, setup, and uh, and then you see these red circles here are the atomic reactors placed. So that's the way how this experiment was working and so they detected oscillation effect uh, in this experiment I'll discuss my blade. So this is some some uh, experimental result. What they see, they see energy distortion of, uh, of, of the spectrum of events. On the left hand side you see um, the upper plot this prompt energy. This is energy of, uh, of um, positron which is produced here and uh, uh, so you see here comparison of the signals in the near holes and the far hole. Uh, you see these blobs corresponds to far detector, which is this EH3. And uh, so there's some difference related to the oscillation, because oscillations to develop need some, some, uh, some distance. And therefore oscillation effect is small in the near detectors and more significant and far detector comparison gives you the oscillation effect. How do you determine the baseline if they have three different reactors? Well, of course, what do you mean? To measure uh, distance? Like here this is the, trivial. In the, yeah. in the plot at the bottom? There is yeah, you see thing. here, so these are the distances, some kind of effective distance. So <coughs> what is this weighted baseline? So which oh, means okay. that they measure and then take into account uh, the power of this atomic reactor, and this is weighted baseline. And you see here significant deviation from 1, which is the ratio of uh, observed to expected signal. Here's oscillation effect still exists, but, uh, but quite small. Reno uh, is, uh, is uh, the, uh, similar kind of uh, setup, but uh, in, in, this is in Korea. Again, you see here uh, six uh, atomic reactors, and uh, there is a far detector and near detectors. Again, comparison gives you uh, the oscillation effect. This is double show experiment in France. Actually, Reno and Diabay still continue to work. This, is, this experiment doesn't work anymore. And you see here, again, detector at the distance something like one kilometer. Uh, there's also near detector, and uh, here are atomic reactors. This is Juno, remember, this is future experiment aimed at the establishing what is the type of mask hierarchy. It's much bigger detector. You see, again, the same idea. You have uh, some, um, some volume, which is spherical, filled in by liquid scintillator, and uh, 20 kilotons now. Uh, of these uh, and uh, so different uh, protection systems and uh, what they want to detect is, is this distortion of the spectrum. You see these wiggly curves and they're slightly different for normal and inverted hierarchy. And you see how precise should be measurement to, to distinguish uh, these two lines. And you need of course to have good energy resolution. Maybe some of you will work on this. Now linear accelerators, this is the scheme which I, you saw already before. Uh, there are th these drift tubes, a pipe inside, and uh, so they alternate in uh, the polarity, and uh, this way you can have acceleration of the particles. On the left hand side, you have slack, oh, this is also schematic uh, view of the slack accelerator. You see, um, so it's a uh, long trajectory and here the storage ring and then here they have detected where uh, electrons and positrons collide. 
we will discuss, uh, we will discuss several discoveries made with this machine. Uh, so this is inside uh, of the tunnel, and here you see an aerial view of, uh, of, of this linear accelerator. And then this are another pictures of, uh, of these accelerators. You see here the tubes and this are the gaps between tubes where accelerators mm -hmm. occur. And here are some of you connect to electric tension of this, of this, this tube. Now it's another a linear accelerator. Pictures, uh, here are synchrotrons. I think this is, uh, this is a telatron. And uh, so magnets and uh, the pipe. And, uh, this is the telatron. This is an aerial view. This is a building of Fermilab. I don't know, maybe some of you will, will work eventually at this place. Uh, the ink. So remember, it's one kilometer uh, radius ring, so that uh, the, the length of, uh, of the circle is six kilometers or so. And this is inside the tunnel. And now this is LHC. Uh, you see again an aerial view, and uh, so this is you see it's a 27 kilometers tunnel, and uh, you see here Geneva area. So let's see where where, where is uh, the airport. So this is the airport of Geneva. Now, of course, you don't see this because the the the, the tunnel is something like say 30 40 meters below the surface, and. Uh, the shape of the rings actually you see quite well and there are four places where you have an intersection of the rings and uh, in these places you, you put the detector and so you can study, uh, uh, study uh, collisions. Now you see also here uh, another accelerator which is pre-accelerator. This is SPS, synchrotron of smaller size. That was used to discover W boson and Z boson previously and then this big ring has been constructed first of all for E plus and minus collisions but now it works uh, as a P, P collider and uh, the energy is here 7 TV this is what is planned uh, but now it works at, uh, at 6.5 TeVs so this is the tunnel inside and there are superconducting magnets here which uh, produce uh, a magnetic field uh, that was some disaster, probably. Oh, well, that's some view. So actually, both tubes for accelerated uh, protons are in the same big, uh, uh, big tube. So these are where protons are moving in, in different directions and then cross at some points. So it was also some problem. Uh, the accelerator. Uh, it was some problem, and uh, a part of, of the of the ring was destroyed. Uh, they said that uh, the temperature actually rose above critical temperature, and they were not superconductors anymore. So the large amount of current actually melted. The well, water. I don't know precisely what. Uh, so I can, I can actually I remember before, but I don't remember what was. The, you, you are thinking about the problem. Mm -hmm. So eventually, yes, uh, they, they they forced them to uh, you know to heat everything, all the system repair, and then cool it again. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, these are some of the experiments. One of them is ATLAS. Um, and uh, you had some prob a problem to solve. So this is actually a coll collision area inside the detector. And everything is then surrounded by many, by system of, of the different detectors, which are aimed to detect different particles. The short living particles, they have special detectors, silicon detectors inside, very close to the beam. Then for muons, which are very penetrating particles, you have these outer detectors. And now at CERN, some new detectors are construct under construction, which are even outside to detect very penetrating particles and weakly interacting particles. So, uh, so you see the length of the detector is 46 meters, and uh, the weight is 7,000 tons. This is another detector, CMS, so let me see, it's about like this, which stands for Compact Magnetic Spectrometer. And uh, again, the setup that you have uh, 
central region where collisions occur, and then this is surrounded by various types of the detector to detect, say, very short-living particles, then an electromagnetic component, and then muons uh, and more even penetrating particles. Now, another uh, this is remember we discussed uh, different techniques of the detection, and one is uh, this Geiger counter which is based on the fact that you apply very high electric tension so the particle which crosses this detector produces discharge discharge so you, it's difficult to say what are properties of the particles you cannot reconstruct the track you cannot uh, you know measure energy uh, because this is non-linear regime and but what you can do this effectively efficiently detect passing of particle through this through this device now this is spark chamber uh, based on the fact that uh, you can have very short pulses of uh, a strong electric field so that uh, the avalanches or discharges not completely uh, developed and so you make the, this kind of snapshots when just avalanche started to develop and you see this track and this is again macroscopic you know this is the size of the you see here, so maybe, maybe this is two meters height device. This is streamer chamber, again based on, on, on this uh, um, beginning of avalanches development and then snapshots. This, uh, here you see Sharpak with, uh, with one of, uh, he actually developed uh, various multi uh, wire chambers. This, this is one of the chambers. When you see here the wires plane, actually in the same plane, essentially in the same central part you have uh, wires in different directions and so they are uh, positively charged display these wires and you have uh, cathodes, negatively charged plane and so then they you uh, detect signals from different wires, uh, time and the strength of the signal and then you are able to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct uh, the track of the particle. Now, uh, it's a muon neutrino discovery. On the left-hand side, you see Bruno Pontecola. I think it's already quite old uh, picture. In a sense, it's not the time when they have uh, this discovery. I think this is already uh, 80s or 90s. So this is Schwartz, uh, Lederman, and uh, <laughs> who remembers? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Steinberger, sorry. So this is really when uh, in uh, their experiment, and you see the track which is induced by muon. So the person is sitting here, observing here, and you have this track. You can see this by eye. It's got this very short moving uh, track. You can just see, see track. Actually, then don't see how it moves. You just at some point you have this track. Now, maybe experiment. Mentioned it, this is to search for mu to e gamma decay in Polchar Institute in uh, Switzerland. And as I said, they have no <coughs> observation of this mu e gamma. Uh, now, uh, so we discussed this uh, discovery of muon neutrino, and the idea was to see if uh, uh, leptons of wrong type are produced or not. So we have muon neutrino. And uh, so we are wondering if this muon neutrino detects or not detects elect so if uh, it produces uh, electrons or not. So muon neutrino in the detector can produce electrons if muon neutrino and tau and electron neutrino are not orthogonal, right? So if they partially coincide. So if they are completely different, you shouldn't see the appearance of electrons or positrons in the muon neutrino pin. That's what has been seen in the first experiment. So they haven't seen appearance of electrons above the background induced by muon neutrinos. Now that was uh, in 61, 62, the first experiment. People continued these experiments and eventually they have found appearance of wrong type of the leptons. And one of these experiments is T2K in uh, Japan, uh, T2K stands for Tokai to Kamioka. 
So here in Tokai, there's accelerator complex, J Park. Uh, so 295 kilometers far from this accelerator complex, you have this detector, Super Kamiokanda, which I have explained, in Kamioka mine. And uh, so the idea to see if muon neutrinos produced at Tokai can, can, can produce electrons in uh, Super Kamiokanda. And they have found the first observation was, was based on something like six, seven events or so. So now they have something like 30 events and also in neutrino and anti-neutrino more. Now, what is the interpretation of these events? Interpretation is that still muon and electron neutrino are orthogonal states. So uh, if you put your detector close to the production area, then you would not see production of electrons in the beam of muon neutrino. However, on the way from the source to the detector, uh, muon neutrinos oscillate into electron neutrino. And then this electron neutrinos produce the signal in, in uh, super Kamiokande. So this is one experiment. And then another one in the United States. Uh, so they have beam produced at uh, Fermi lab. And uh, the detector is something like 810 kilometers far from the production in Ash River, as close to the uh, Canadian borders. So they have slightly higher energies, and uh, the idea is the same. So you produce uh, uh, muon neutrinos and then give them time or distance to oscillate, and they see if they're producing electron neutrino or electrons or not in the detector. So this is a scintillator detector, and you see here the planes of the scintillator and the planes, and one of these events, uh, there's a neutrino colliding here and producing uh, secondary tracks. And then you look for tracks which corresponds to electron neutrinos, what, or electrons. What is the median of oscillation here? So what is... In the medium where the neutrinos oscillate. Through. What does it mean, medium? The matter, what kind of matter is that? Well, they, they store the Earth. They are propagating through the Earth. Oh, okay. uh, uh, Earth's matter effect here uh, exists, but it's not big still. But it exists, yeah, the matter effect. It's usual soil, so you have a trajectory. I, I don't remember what is the depth. The maximal depth, I think, can be 10, 30 meters or something. But in kilometers, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I think that's it. So, questions? <coughs> no? <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a part in the LSC that is Alice, right? Sorry? Alice, Alice in the LSC. What does it stand for? Atlas. 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 No, oh. Alice. 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 Alice, this is for uh, heavy ion collision, uh, 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 detection of, uh, uh, of uh, interactions of heavy ions. So they are accelerating not only, not only uh, protons, but also heavy ions. Later I will show you another set of, uh, of, of slides uh, 
they want to do all of this coverage. So today we will start uh, the second part of the course devoted to mostly to the quarks, so quarks and leptons. By 60s, uh, researchers detected many different particles many had them strongly interacting particles. And um, the idea of, uh, of quarks appeared uh, from classification of these uh, discovered particles. People had strongly interacting particles. Classification of of hadrons. So hadrons are strongly interacting particles. Uh, so strongly means they have strong interactions. And these are interactions which are responsible for nuclear structure, for keeping uh, protons and neutrons inside the nuclei. And these are short range forces. The size is inverse of pi and mass. It's something like 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. And these uh, interactions have big coupling. So the coupling is bigger than, much bigger than one. So we'll come to this later. But uh, first we will discuss classification of the strongly interacting particles. So first what I will discuss is baryon number. And uh, uh, among the particles, what has been discovered, hadrons of uh, with different spin, the particles classified as mesons and baryons. Mesons have zero baryon number and baryons have a non-zero, it's plus or minus one. So particles like pine, K meson, rho meson, have baryon number zero. These are mesons. Particles like proton, neutron, Lambda hyperon, sigma hyperon, they have uh, baryon number one, and corresponding antiparticles have baryon number minus one. So baryon number is uh, additive quantum number. And baryon number minus one. Now, these particles have integer spin. Zero, rho meson has one. Now, these particles have same integer spin. One hull, some of these baryons have three hull. So the question, why do we need to introduce another quantum number? Why and spin is not enough for classification? So why baryon number should be introduced? Somebody knows this. Because all mesons with baryon number, which you call baryon number zero, all the mesons have integer spin. These particles with non-zero baryon number, baryons have semi-integer spin. Why this is not enough? So why on the top of this 
still new quantum number has been introduced. There will be some decays that may conserve the spin, but uh, need to consider also the value of numbers. True. So, uh, actually, let me give you some examples, not even decay, but uh, interactions. So, pine can interact with proton. And in the final state, spin or angular momentum conservation, for instance, allows the process like this. And then some number of pines. So everything is okay from the point of view of uh, spin. However, here we have one proton and here we have three protons and this process doesn't occur. And to explain the fact that this uh, transition doesn't exist, uh, you need to invent another quantum number. And of course, baryon number is not conserved here because you have baryon number one here and three in, in final state. In the same way, you, may have, you have no processes like proton plus proton uh, leads to n number of pines. Again, angular momentum allows you to, to, to have such a transition, but baryon number doesn't. So this process doesn't exist because you have baryon number 2 and baryon number 0 in, in final state. So to explain this type of selection rules or conservation, you need to introduce new quantum numbers. So this is why we introduce the baryon number. Okay. So next, high the spin. So what are experimental facts which led to introduction of isospin? So what is basis, experimental basis? Equality in the masses. The similarity in the masses of proton and neutron. Okay. So there are basically two important uh, points here is the quality of masses. of a proton and neutron, they're still different slightly, but close. Uh, also pines, pi zero has approximately the same mass as pi plus pi minus. What else? In, in strong interaction. So what is strong, strong interactions? The isospin is also conserved. No, we don't know yet. We haven't introduced yet spin. So what what are the, the observations? So another important fact is that uh, strong interactions do not change if you substitute protons by neutrons. So the uh, strong interactions are. Uh, invariant with respect to interchange of a neutron and proton. So to say proton and neutron have the same strong interactions. How do we know this? that was established, that proton and neutron have the same strong directions. By studying the nuclei. Hmm? By studying the nuclei. So what precisely has been studied? Right. So uh, the initial observation was that uh, mirror nuclei have the same energy levels. The same 
approximately the same system of energy levels. So what are examples of this mirror new flame? So for instance, tritium and helium-3. So in tritium, you have one proton and two neutrons. Here you have two protons and uh, one neutron. So which means that these two nuclei are distinguished by uh, substitution of uh, one proton to one neutron or one source. So the energy levels are the same, nearly the same. Um, and since this is due to the structure of, uh, of a nuclei is due to strong interactions, this means that implies that the strong interactions for proton and neutron should be the same. The difference of levels is due to electromagnetic interactions because here you have different electromagnetic interactions within the nuclei, here you have two protons and of course they repel and that produces some change of the energy levels. Here you have just one proton. That has been computed and uh, in a very good agreement with what is expected. So which means that some deviation from equality of energy levels can be explained by, by, uh, by electromagnetic interactions. Uh, here the energy levels remain of the electron? No. Mm -hmm. So this is nuclear energy. Sorry, let me, let me explain. So in the same way as uh, uh, in the case of atom, you may have nuclear in excited state. Okay, so which means that you can irradiate your nuclei by gammas and uh, you have energy levels they are not like a, like a Palmer series in, in atoms, they are more complicated, but nevertheless you have different energies and then you compare this for helium, uh, for uh, tritium and helium-3 and they are quite close to each other and some difference can be explained by difference of, of, uh, of electromagnetic interactions. Actually, the same is here, some difference between masses of the proton and neutron are related to electromagnetic interactions. Okay? Now, either spin has been introduced by Heisenberg. In 1932, very soon after the discovery of, of neutron, Although the name isospin has been given slightly later by, by Wigner. I think it was uh, 36 or 37 later. So what is the idea? The idea is that proton and neutron are actually different states of the same particle. we call nucleon. In analogy with what we have, for instance, for electrons. And in the case of electron, we have two different polarizations with projection of the spin one half on the axis of Z, for instance, and minus one half. So we have two different states of electron. And then Heisenberg has had an idea that probably proton and neutron are just uh, like uh, differently polarized uh, electron states. So this is an in analogy. With this electron. So the degree of freedom in the case of electrons is spin. <coughs> and you have different projections of the spin. In the case of uh, proton and neutron, that has been called isospin. So that proton and neutron have different 
projections. of isospin onto third projection in new space. It's not configuration space like in the case of electron, but one can imagine that there is some internal space formed by I3, I1, and I2. So and in this space, proton and neutron have the different polarizations in internal space formed by the components of this isospin network. So this new concept appeared that there's kind of internal space, you can introduce internal space and transformations in this internal space and uh, that reflects properties of, of some particles. So instead of total spin, now we have isospin, and the third projection, we have the third projection of isospin, and here also we have the total isospin equals square equals E1 square plus I2 square plus I3 square. Okay. So, from one polarization to another polarization, you can uh, get performing rotation in configuration space. Here, uh, going from proton to neutron, you need to make rotation in this isosphere, in internal, uh, sphere, in internal space. Two projections of Two projections of uh, electron have the same electromagnetic interactions. So this means that electromagnetic interactions are invariant with respect to, uh, to these rotations. In the same way, you can say that strong interactions are invariant with respect to these permutations which I have already shown, proton and neutron. How to formalize this? We formalize this in terms of symmetries of our Hamiltonian. So what we are saying strong interactions are invariant with respect to these rotations means that the Hamiltonian which descri describes strong interactions and this Hamiltonian should be represented in terms of wave functions of proton, neutron and some other particles to which proton and neutron interact and this Hamiltonian shouldn't change if you will permute operators of proton and neutron plus you probably need to do some other transformations of other particles. And this is the origin of, uh, of this equality of uh, levels of uh, mirror nuclei of the, uh, and uh, the, the fact that the proton and neutron have the same interactions. So let us formalize this a little bit more. So we have proton and neutron, which we call different states of a new particle, nucleon. And let us introduce transformation, which interchange proton and neutron. And so let me introduce this uh, transformation in the following way, U, in this space, proton and neutron, which is 0, 1, minus 1, and 0. So it's not only I'm permuting them, but also give the mass. Let me give the sign minus here. Okay? So acting by U, for instance, on the proton state, 
what I will get u, and proton is 1, 0 in this space, what I will get is uh, uh, minus 1, 0. Okay, so just if I insert here uh, this matrix, I will get this one. So it will be minus. Okay. So to formulate the symmetry, I need to introduce transformation. And then to see how my Hamiltonian reacts on this transformation. If it is invariant, doesn't change or change. Symmetry means that my Hamiltonian, my Lagrangian or whatever it is, is invariant with respect to transformation. So this is how we express the symmetry. So let me say a little bit more on this. What does it mean that a Hamiltonian is invariant? So suppose we start this Hamiltonian, which depends on n. So Hamiltonian should be eventually expressed in terms of uh, wave functions or operators or fields or, or the fields, or the fields of this proton and neutron, right? Involved. Now we are doing transformation. So from n, we make transformation of this type. transformation. Now what we are doing is the following. We can use this relation and write that n is u minus 1 n prime. So these are initial fields. These are transformed fields. So in general this n prime can be mixture of proton and neutron wave functions and operators. Now we insert this into Hamiltonian, what we get is u minus 1 n prime, okay? And now, if that can be reduced to a Hamiltonian in terms of prime, in prime, then we say that Hamiltonian is invariant. So this is invariance. So, which means that the form of the Hamiltonian in terms of transformed fields is the same as the form of the Hamiltonian in terms of initial fields. The form doesn't change. So we do transformation from initial fields to new one, then insert, and if we show, we can show that Hamiltonian can be reduced to the previous initial form, but now in terms of new fields, then we are saying that uh, Hamiltonian is invariant with respect to these transformations. Yeah? Uh, but this transformation doesn't exchange the proton and neutron. It seems the protons minus the neutron. Yeah, in this case, we, I, I will explain this later because uh, this is schematically because uh, Hamiltonian of interaction uh, depends also on pi in the fields. So in the minimal version, right? So you need to introduce also pi ions, and they also are involved in the transformations. I'm doing this because I want to have immediate connection to to uh, to to this SU2 symmetry. And Oh, that's the idea. But moduli of these fields are so when you square eventually this minus doesn't play any role. Oh, that's, uh, but, but this is a generic way to do it even when we study uh, you know the uh, parity symmetry in uh, Dirac field we actually uh, you know send the creation of it or one type to the negative equation. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Might, you might connect to this. Okay. So this is very important because if you understand this, then you understand all this philosophy of the symmetry. So you introduce some transformations 
say old fields and new fields, which connect all the new fields. And then you show that the Hamiltonian in terms of new field has the same form as it had in the old fields. The form doesn't change. I so for instance, if you had uh, probably I, because I want to, ex to explain this in more details uh, later. So what I mean is the following. Suppose you have x squared plus i squared, y squared. So this is our Hamiltonian. Now if I do rotation in x and y, you can find out that uh, that will give me x prime plus y prime squared if I do rotation. So this is invariance, because the form is the same here and here in terms of old variables and new one. This means that this form is invariant with respect to rotation in the space x and y. So this story will, repeat it, will be repeated uh, you know, many, many times till the end of my course. So if you understand this, then uh, we'll go first. This is what, what we mean by invariance. You do some transformations, fields, or even coordinates, or both fields and coordinates, and you show that, uh, that your Lagrangian or Hamiltonian or equation of motion, you can uh, speak about invariance of different objects, right? They do not change form when you go from the old variables to new ones. So, um, it seems that uh, strong interactions are invariant with respect to, uh, to, this, to this type of the transformations. And the invariance of, uh, with respect to this transformation also ensure that the masses are the same, right? So, mass terms are m proton, m proton, m proton, and m neutron, and here's neutron, and neutron. And if you do these transformations, so like, like this, you will actually have twice minus sign, and so therefore it doesn't matter for, for this. So then this term will be permuted with this one, and therefore invariance requires equality of masses. This is for mass terms. And this is even for kinetic terms. Right? The kinetic term is, is uh, again, uh, by linear form of this P and M. Sorry? But we know that the two masses are not the same. Yeah, so which means that this symmetry is broken by electromagnetic interactions. Because the difference of masses is due to electromagnetic interactions. So that's the key point. Also, weak interactions are, uh, are breaking this, this symmetry. So which means that this is not exact symmetry of all the theory. Actually, we will observe then that this is to some extent accidental symmetry. So the permutation which I have just uh, discussed is discrete transformation. But, uh, but it was already immediately idea that actually this permutation is one of the transformations of uh, bigger symmetry, continuous symmetry, and uh, uh, this is transform unitary transformation 0, 1, minus 1, uh, 0 is the part of SU2 symmetry, which is special unitary symmetry 2 by 2 matrices, complex matrices. So this is element of, of, of the symmetry transformation. And then we can discuss maybe our Hamiltonian is invariant not only with respect to this particular transformation, but with respect to much bigger symmetry, continuous symmetry SU2. In this case, we are saying that proton and neutron are transformed Under 
fundamental representation of SU2. And fundamental representation has dimension 2, right? So I can say that P and N are transformed under uh, this uh, represent representation 2, the fundamental representation of SU2. And so, the strong interactions are invariant with respect to SU2 transformation. So what is the sense? We are doing some transformations, so what? The point is that we are doing these transformations, and Hamiltonian is invariant with respect to these transformations. Hamiltonian, again, depends on the proton and neutron fields and also pine field. So we do transformations, which has in general form that you feel in all these elements of this, of this more com uh, complicated transformation, still our uh, Hamiltonian is invariant with respect to these transformations. So that was proposed and then it has been checked and confirmed that in fact Hamiltonian of, uh, of strong interactions is invariant with respect to, to this more complex, uh, more extended symmetry continuous as you took symmetry. As you took symmetry has a generator which has the form then the sigma 3 which has the form 1 half and minus 1 half. So it has actually three generators if you remember, right? So one of these is the diagonal which is sigma 3. So let's see how the sigma 3 acts on the proton. Proton has uh, prescription 1, 0, and then sigma 3 acting on proton give us what? 1 half of the proton. Wait, functional operator. Okay? So acting on neutron, and neutron is 0, 1, sigma 3 acting on neutron gives us minus one half neutron and this plus one half and minus one half are just precisely related to diagonal elements of this of this matrix and so these equations can be considered as equations for eigenstates and eigenvalues uh, of, uh, of this operator sigma 3 and so the uh, proton it has an eigenvalue one half, neutron minus one half, and therefore we can identify sigma three with our I three operator, with the third projection of I S P operator. So this is an important feature that uh, if you have some symmetry, and the symmetry uh, has this described by generators, and some of these generators are diagonal, then these diagonal generators can be identified with operators of some physical quantities. In our example, this is the third projection of isospin. We will discuss later more uh, complicated symmetries, bigger symmetries. They have uh, more than one diagonal uh, generators. So these symmetries can correspond to more than one quantum uh, quantity, physical quantity. So we discussed also pions. And uh, three pines has been found 
pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero. And therefore, triplet of SU2 as a spin group. Well, actually, under uh, this transformation, which I have written, uh, what's going on is uh, uh, that uh, this pi, uh, what you will have, you will have exchange under this U transformation, which I have written before. It will be minus pi minus, minus pi plus, as I remember. And here is pi zero. And this appearance of minus sign will compensate minus sign when we have transformations of proton and neutron, so that Lagrangian will be invariant. And Lagrangian or Hamiltonian in the simplest form is given by nucleon. Um, then pi and nucleon. So you can construct with some coupling constant uh, invariant Lagrangian of this form, or Hamiltonian of this form, which describes interactions of nucleons with pi. So this is an example. I think I will give you some exercise to check. So this type of the Hamiltonian is invariant with respect to SU2 transformations. Okay. So this is what describes uh, a coupling of uh, nucleons with pions. So for instance, it provides pion, transition to neutron, and here is pi minus, or proton, proton, pi zero. This is naive of the theory of, of strong interactions. Things are much more complicated. However, this Hamiltonian describes uh, uh, this type of the interactions. And these interactions are invariant with respect to SU2 ISSP and symmetry group. So, which means that, so this is triplet of SU2, and the triplet is formed as product of uh, fundamental representations, right? So, the yeah, isospin, third projection, of this multiplet is plus one, zero, and minus one. What is exactly is the pi in the Hamiltonian? So it's here. What is? So here, what I have written pi is is this triplet. Uh -huh. Sorry. N are doublets, and this is triplet, and you can get invariant combinations. So, so the U here is the action of U on T. Sorry? The U here is the action of, of U on T. Yes, it's under, under this. No. So let me put. Sorry. I'm rushing a little bit. No need to do this. But U is the 2 2 matrix. Oh, God. So, now that should be taken in representation, in triplet representation. And in triplet representation, I think this matrix is, uh, that's the product of all this. So the triplet is constructed as uh, the product of uh, doublet representation. So to say, if this has two indices, then so if this has one index, so doublet has one index, then uh, then uh, uh, this adjoint representation has two indices of uh, of SU two. So literally, the components that you know, just to avoid any confusion. So Hamiltonian is coupling. Here is n i, then i and j and j. So i is 1, 2, and uh, so n 1 is proton and 2 is neutron. And then this pi and form the matrix, and uh, the matrix is, uh, say, I think it's pi plus, pi minus, and here's one half pi zero, and one half pi zero. Let me check this. Yeah. 
So you can write the triplet in this form. And uh, so in this, in this form, it's easy to, to, to trace uh, the invariance because you have this connection of indices. So you have exercise to share this. And then you will tell me if it is correct or not. Last thing which I want to discuss today is connection of uh, isospin with electric charge. Come back to proton and neutron. We have proton and neutron, and they have isospin one half and minus one half. And they have electric charges plus one and zero. And you see isospin changed by one unit when they go from neutron to proton, and the electric charge changes by one unit, and so that gives you an idea that somehow isospin and uh, electric charge should be related. I3 and Q should be related. By the way, for pines, we have pi plus, pi zero, pi minus. The third projection of isospin is one, zero, and minus one. And it coincides with electric charge. So for pines, which have zero baryon number, uh, we have just coincidence of uh, electric charge and uh, third projection of isospin. And for proton and neutron, there is kind of shift. And this gives you an, an idea that baryon number should somehow be involved in this relation between uh, electric charge and isospin. And the question for this relation is the third projection of isospin plus baryon number over 2. So proton and neutron have baryon number 1, and therefore adding B over 2, which is 1 half, gives us precisely the charge Q. So this is the relation between uh, electric charge and the self-projection of isospin. Fine. Now we have strange particles. And actually, there are two doublets of strange particles, K plus and K zero. And they have strangeness one. And K zero bar, K minus, they have strangeness minus one. And of course, these particles have baryon number zero. Now, how you would write a relation between electric charge and, uh, and isospin in this case? So it should be still I3 because the change of the charge by one unit. So we can add B over 2. But then this is not enough, right? Because then we are uh, in the situation uh, which, as, as you have for proton and neutron. And um, unfortunately here B is zero, right? So barrier number is zero here. So how we can get correct expression for, for Q? Add S. So room. we can add S, right? So we can add S. Barrier number is zero. And uh, if S uh, is 1 or minus 1, we can reproduce electric charges in this system. So this is so-called for formula of uh, Nishijima of Kubo. Which is valid for 
strange or non-strange particles in general if such a formula. So what is staying here in nominator B plus S is called hypercharge. And uh, so therefore electric charge can be also written as uh, I3 plus hypercharge over 2. This kind of simple relations have deep, uh, deep physical meaning, which we will discuss later. Sometimes it is also called the Mohan Nishijima formula. Sorry? Sometimes it is also called the Mohan Nishijima formula. Yeah, but uh, so this is what I know. Nishijima Kubo had introduced this. When we have other types of forms, like top and bottom, then we have to add topness and bottomness. So, we haven't yet discussed. Don't, 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 don't rush. Yeah. So, this concept makes sense only in the context of strong interaction, right? So, it doesn't say anything about data decay regression when we have to neutron that Yes, yeah. Same yeah. Well, you see, in the case of weak interactions, we introduce weak isospin, which uh, has kind of the same, the same type of prescription for now in, in quark sector. It's a uh, quark and big quark, and we introduce weak isospin. So this weak isospin uh, plays quite a similar role. To this. But this, this isospin is for strong interactions. So, uh, are there any magic for weak isospin? Yeah, standard model is, is, is based on this. Uh, so tablets of the standard model have uh, this weak isospin. Precisely. So neutrino and electron have isospin. So isospin is one out, yeah? Well, we can uh, we talk about quarks also, because they are entering uh, the standard model on the same ground. Mm -hmm. And the meaning is that of these doublets, because they are connected by charged currents, of weak interaction charged currents. Okay? So, yeah, then that's it for today. We will meet after tomorrow. Or tomorrow you will have a tutorial, right? At the same time. And then, who are two other guys who? You and? I can sound. Hey, good second view of <laughs> Okay, maybe so please come in five minutes. Mm -hmm. I did not you used to be the minimum then I didn't still have this one. I guess I have not done this one. Yeah. I think that here it should be minimal energy instead of maximum because of the relation. But so this one between two scatterers. Uh, it will be so fine. Can you explain why? Well, actually, I'm I think it should be maximum. Yeah, it should be maximum because uh, after a certain limit, the wave will become. Yeah, smaller. so because when you increase energy, you decrease uh, the you decrease the wavelengths. That's the thing. In this case, yeah. this is energy is proportional to the to the wavelength. So the inverse uh -huh. so, so that's yeah. why this deflation <laughs> says that. What we can find is the minimal energy for this. For this reaction. Well, again, I think it's maximum. Uh, no, no, maximum. Uh, maximum. Uh, this is the minimum. Because when you have a smaller and smaller and bigger and bigger energy, you destroy at some point coherence. So this yeah. is the point. And you want to find uh, energy up to which you still have coherence. Yeah. So at very high energies, uh, you have uh, no coherence, right? Mm. Very high energies because wavelengths is, uh, is is very small. Yep.
and therefore you have no coherence. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the criteria of coherence that you have uh, written in this problem, I'm not very much. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So you have two scatters, right? So you find what are the waves from these two scatters. And uh, uh, the coherence is destroyed when you have a big difference of the phases. Okay, so at the criteria you have said that the difference should not be bigger than... Difference should not be big. Difference of uh, phases should not be bigger than something. Yes, but that something is what implies that if I substitute here, I will find the, mean, the lower bound, not the upper bound. On the left hand side, it's not lower bound, which means uh, that energy should be bigger. So, so lower bound means that energy is bigger than this lower bound, meaning, right? Yeah. So, which means that that actually admits that if you increase energy, then you still have coherence mm -hmm. about this minimum. No, it's opposite. Okay. And uh, okay. uh, on the left hand side, uh, we should put the difference. Uh, it's uh, actually, I think you need to find difference of phases, difference right? Of phases, and yeah. then uh, to say that this difference should be smaller than this quantity. Yeah. 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 